Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Another edition of the Volpe Bazo Report. I'm your co-host, Dominic Volpe. With me, Andy Bazo, our other co-host. And our special guest tonight is Bob Castelli, former state assemblyman, running for state senate. Welcome, Bob, to the show. Thank you for this, having me. You got, thank you, Robert. This is actually a special taping. That's right. This is being taped now on August 26th. Six because we wanted to get this in while the primary voters still had a chance to make an informed, intelligent decision. And quickly, homework, you know that you can see my column every week in the Mayor Pack News and in the Yorktown News. And so I want to get that out of the way. Dominic, uh, we got a Republican primary, and uh, you're the underdog, Bob. Absolutely. Dominic. Go ahead. What's the first question you'd like to ask the underdog? Because you've been in a number of primaries. You are experienced <laughs> at primaries. So I'm going to let you get the first question out of the Well, mind. the first question is everybody said you weren't going to be able to collect enough signatures. Uh, there was no way that you could get the ground forces out there in order to get whatever the necessary number was. Where do we stand today? Did you, were you able to get enough signatures? Give, give us what's the story, what's going on. Absolutely. <laughs> um, remember, I have been the Republican and Conservative Party nominee and an office holder four times and two times, respectively. We got enough signatures. I will tell you that the Senate and the Murphy campaign tried to knock us off the ballot. Three out of three times we went to the Board of Elections in Albany. Three out of three times we won. They filed a lawsuit to invalidate our signatures and thereby disenfranchise, I might add, our Republican wow. voters. Finally, after being humiliated, they withdraw their lawsuit. So we are on the ballot. We are in the primary September 9th. Okay. Okay, now, Good. we have big issue in New York of corruption, which you will get into farther down before the end of the show. But you were, you said you're former assemblyman. You were part of Albany. Terror, your opponent has never been to Albany. Your Democrat opponent, should you win the primary, has never been to Albany. How do you come across now to the voters, to, the, to our viewers, as the reformer? Okay, well, first of all, there are honest and honorable men and women on both sides of the aisle and both sides of every issue up there. And there are stinkers on both sides of the aisle and both sides of every issue. I have been known as a reformer. As you know, I was in the state police. I did public corruption investigations there. Did you? The New York Ch did you make any arrests? Absolutely. Judge, police chief, state officials. Jeez. So, uh, yeah, I've got the track record for this one. So but you can smell it. Oh, absolutely. And, and as you know, the New York Times called me the kind of reformer that Albany needed. And Mayor Ed Koch, a Democrat, called me a hero of reform because I had the backbone to go in there and put in legislation and sponsor that to do some of the things that most what people What was want. that legislation? Because... That would be around 2011. So well, the first you thing, have all new people coming to the absolutely, and and one of the first pieces of those legislations was uh, I supported and helped get passed, and we did pass the Public Integrity Act of 2011. I also put in a bill for the toughest ethics law in New York State. I put in another bill for term limits. Of course, I was the only one on the election committee, I might add, that voted for that, Republican or Democrat, I might add. I put in another one for disclosure of outside sources of income by legislators. So, Oh, Sheldon, Sheldon must have sent you a birthday oh, card on me. your birthday. Yeah, no, he, he <laughs> absolutely loved me, absolutely. So, um, but, you know, we talk the talk and walk the walk. You've got to have a backbone and, and a certain amount of business and political acumen to swim with the sharks up there and not get eaten alive. So why is the establishment so scared of you? What well, seems to be the problem? Well, you're, all you're doing is you're reflecting what the voters here in your home district or probably throughout New York State are saying. Throw the bums out. You're trying to approach that. So what are they worried about? Well, not, that's exactly well, well not it. only that, but you're just being the same guy you were when they supported you in the assembly. Did you think about running for the assembly before you answer his question? I, I was asked to run for the assembly. I was told they'd pay for the seat if I'd get out of this race. But uh, I'm not for sale now. I wasn't for sale then. At the end of the day, this is the seat where I can do the most for the people I serve. And, and I work for you. I don't work for them up in Albany. So 
That's one of the reasons why they're afraid of having me back there. Okay, so you were saying to him, Dominic, I forgot. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I thought well, it was no, a no, perfect no. opening to no, find no, it's, out it's, it's, if he sure. thought about the assembly. So, Fair, so obviously you're not the establishment, and what scares them? It's the fact that you are the reformer. You're the one that's going to change and shake Albany, and they don't want that because right now they keep a tight lid up there, and they don't want things to change. Sure, and remember, I, I swum with the Sharks in, in two terms in the assembly, and I survived. That's a scary thing. Not only did I do Without so, the taint of corruption, this is important for the viewers to know. Absolutely. Because a lot of these things that we're seeing convicted now started in 2009, the investigations. Yeah, absolutely. While you were still in office, and you were never tainted by this. No, absolutely. That's not. what I'm saying. This is important for people to know because you saw these sharks, as you call them. These convict the convictions alone that the feds have gotten now. Has any of them surprised you? No, not at all, not at all. I, you know, I said to somebody when I first got up there, I said, you know, I wish I could go back in the state police for one more day and arrest a bunch of these people. <laughs> um, I, I'd have given up the seat to do that, and, and everybody would have been happy. You would have done so I, much good. I did it, yeah. There is a price to corruption to the taxpayer, isn't there? Truly, ab absolutely. I mean, there is a tremendous price to corruption, not the least of which is to all of us because you're painted with the same broad brush. As I said, there are honest and honorable men and women up there. And they're on both sides of the aisle. And by the way, I had a reputation of working across the aisle with people who were the good people to get stuff done. At the end of the day, you send people like me there to do your job. And being a jerk and giving firebrand speeches and getting nothing done is not what you send me up there to do. Right. You send me there to get bills passed, which I did. And we did good work. Well, let me ask you, you talk about working with, uh, now, the problem with a, a lot of compromise on Republican sides is that the, uh, their idea of compromise is to drop what they believe and go with the Democrats. Now, I'm assuming you're saying you didn't do this. You were able to compromise and maintain your principles. I'm assuming that's what Absolutely. you're saying. You, I mean, you don't have to sell your soul and, and, and give up your principles for, for the things you believe in to get work done. When you, con remember, I was also trained as a hostage negotiator, so, right. you know, I'm used to dealing with people yeah. like this, so. But well, you didn't know that part. I, sorry, I didn't know that. The fact of the matter is, when you're dealing with people up there, compromise is what's necessary frequently to get the bills passed. I've done bills with people who are diametrically opposed to me from, from a political and philosophical sense. But what made me an effective legislator, I believe at least, was the fact that I could find the one thing that you as my opponent across the aisle or you as a person across the aisle, one thing we believed in, whether it was veterans issues, whether it was the elderly protecting Epic, there whether was always it was a one common keeping, bond the, that you keeping the VA home in Montreal. In other words, open. keeping it focused to what you agreed on and trying to keep the outside yeah. parts. Yeah, exactly. You don't need to focus on the 99 parts that are different from both your philosophies. You need to focus on the one where we agree and say, you know what? We could do this together. Which is usually the nut of any measure. You know, it sounds, exactly. like, it sounds like with our, our, our friend Mike Kaplowitz, who's the chairman of the Westchester Board of Legends, he's, he, you know, he, you know, he, he tries to work with the, with the minority Republicans and the Democrats to find that part of the stuff they agree with to avoid the lawsuits, Absolutely. which were killing Westchester. Where have Absolutely. you been on veterans? Speaking of the yes. veterans at Montrose, where, well, where as, have you as, been with that? Well, as, as, as you may you know, done. I am a Vietnam veteran. I dropped out of high school when I was 17, enlisted in the Army, volunteered to serve in Vietnam. I served there proudly as an infantry sergeant with the 1st Air Cavalry Division, 1968, the Tet Offensive in 1969. I was the ranking member on Veterans Affairs in the Assembly, and I passed a number of important bills for veterans up there. They are near and dear to my heart. These are the people who I have to protect, along with people who are senior citizens, people who do not have a voice up there. You know, they're not the big constituencies because they don't put in a lot of money to contribute to your campaign. They're just the people who are the fabric of the nation, not and only, you got to help. Yeah, but still, the reality is this. Veterans and seniors vote. Amen. They are your biggest could guarantee and they people read. that they right, read too. The biggest guarantee that no matter the weather, they're going to the polls. Well, you to know, make it's, the, it's funny you mention it. We, you know, we talk about these these palm cards here, yeah. which uh, you know all of us have. We we spend a fortune to make these things. We actually did a study once and determined that those palm cards are good 
from your mailbox to the first trash receptacle you find. <laughs> so whatever I've your message never is, be, I've never believed in robocalls upon cars. It could be 10 feet. It could be 30. If you got a long driveway, you're lucky. Maybe someone actually read it. With one exception, and those are senior citizens. Senior citizens will read this. You know, they come from the greatest generation. They come from an era where they recognize that voting was a sacred honor and, and a privilege to have in this country. Sure, and a lot of they sense. vote. Well, it's funny, you know, I reach between Yorktown and Mayapack, I reach uh, 34,000 homes, uh, 34, 50,000 homes. So you figure maybe two people per household. The people that stop me on the street, and I bet you you found this the same thing in your experience, to ask us something, were well, we seniors, because they saw our work. Right, and they care. Yes. And they yes. care. Now, this is not to say that young people don't, but they are not as informed as senior citizens are. Trouble with that generation is more informed. See, the trouble with the low information voter, they don't know their low information. But you try to get to the seniors that's given up the apathetic. I wrote a column about this a couple of weeks ago that I, I was going to, when I saw the polls, 60% of the people don't care, but the guy's corrupt. It's not going to influence their vote as long as they let me screw it out, con con you know, uh, uh, consequence, as long as they give me my check in the mail every month. I don't care if they're thieves. And I said, oh, how do you fight this? How You can't. Then I had a couple of customers. They were seniors, to be exact at different times, say, we were going to give up voting. We were not going to vote this year, but you haven't stopped fighting. Amen. Neither have I. Right. Now, can you, I'm going to ask you one more question, and I'm going to turn it over to Dominic for a fair guy, because I see he's anxious like I usually am. You were a cop. Yes. You were in the military. Yes. You've been in Albany. Yes, sir. Can you corrupt an honest man? No. No. You know, just like you can't be a little bit pregnant, you either are or you're not. You can't be a little bit corrupt, you either are or you're not. If you take $20 to let someone off a traffic ticket, you're a corrupt cop. If you take half a million to let a major drug dealer from the cartels off, you're a corrupt cop. And by the way, we arrest you for the same felony because it's not a dollar and cents issue. It's a violation of the public trust. If you're an honest and honorable man, you're not for sale. Period. And that's where we turn to the pay raise. <laughs> so what happened in Yorktown? Just recently. I mean, you only, I mean, I know firsthand, but I know you've read the stories. <laughs> yes, I have. What, what did. Great story, by the way. What did your opponent do in your town? Well, uh, as you know, apparently, yeah, but they don't. apparently there was a vote behind closed doors in executive session to give the town board a raise. And what is most troublesome to me is the fact that that particular vote was done not only behind closed doors, but it was leaked to a CSEA contract for future raises, which at the very least- Linked, is not, you linked, said leaked. Linked to a linked, CSEA right, okay. contract negotiation, which by the way, the board negotiates. Now, at the very least, that's a conflict of interest. Potentially, it could be illegal. Um, it is something that somebody who is savvy, who has been around the block in this business, would never do. Even if we in the legislature voted ourselves a raise, it would be before the entire legislature and on TV. When was the last time the legislature got a raise? Just let me do this a minute. Here's 14 a years ago. Okay. And they probably didn't deserve one. Now, why, and this is important to what makes it relevant to what happened sure. in Yorktown, why haven't they given themselves a raise since 1999? Well, first of all, I don't think they deserved it, but more importantly, they didn't want to have to go before the public in a transparent position what I mean. and vote themselves a raise. That's what I'm talking about. And not only that, by tying it to the CSA contract, they never have to go to before the, port, the public again and say, I want more money. No, because it's done in a work session, which you're allowed to do out of the public eye. That's right, because it's personnel. Absolutely. And so if somebody's willing to do this behind closed doors, is that something we need more of in Albany? No, well, we, you know, this is what we have in Albany. Three men in a room. So, you know, in Yorktown, I guess you got four men in a room. Um, I, you know, I don't know that I know these people on the board. I don't think that they intended to do something that was illegal. But the point is that they would do something that's improper says to me that they didn't have the political it wasn't, acumen it to do this It wasn't the, right the illegal. It was the fact, and I know this firsthand, yeah. they were tired of the public going to them saying, you don't deserve more money. Right. They don't want to hear it anymore. They thought that they could 
get their raises without having, which I assume the taxpayers, their boss, saying, that, we don't want to hear from you anymore. No, that's the bottom line. What they right. did is they didn't want to go to the public forum and say, guess what, we're going to try to give ourselves 3% 3, 3 tax or a 3% increase, whatever it is like that. And they just didn't want to, because they knew the fury that the public was right. going to have. But you know, They my, circumvented the process by attaching it to the CSEA increase. And you're right, it's a conflict of interest. That's what clearly my, it is. You know, my concern is this. Look, I, I know these people, they're decent guys. I don't think they intended to do something I'm illegal. Not certain, never but intimidated. A, a I certain, never intimidated there's that. There's a certain level of political naivete associated with doing something like this. Now, if you can't do this at a town board level, and I served on a town board, remember, yeah. okay? Then when you go up, not just one step, but you go up three more steps into the state senate where a lot is there and a lot's riding on it. $136 billion budget is riding right. on this. Then, now you're swimming with the sharks. You gotta be careful and you gotta watch what you do there. Right. You need to have had experience to do this job up there. Right? Now, one thing you told, you keep saying experience, and I'm gonna do a little inside baseball here. Dominic okay. loves inside baseball. Would an experienced politician or a man running for office or a person in the political field, somebody that actually had experience, was in touch with the feelings that do this during an election cycle? Absolutely not. Should I mean, I, no. every, everybody that's in office now that I talk to, they said, what kind of nut job would vote themselves a raise? Two weeks from a primary. Right. Yeah. No, I, and, and, you know, but I'm just saying an experience, because that all comes with experience. You don't have selective experience. Either you can, like you say, run with the sharks. You can, you, you, you either have the instincts. You're a policeman. You were a detective. You said you arrested corrupt people. You could see it. You had an instinct for knowing where to go. Truly. Well, the same thing in politics. It's not only an instinct of knowing where to go, but where not to go. Absolutely. He doesn't have that. Absolutely. And in Albany, when you're with those vicious people, and not only that, but the media is just as vicious up there, you need to have instincts so you don't let yourself standing out there with your pants down, with you know, looking naked before the world. Uh, Mr. Castelli, True. where where are we? I'm looking at your palm card. Speaking of it, I'm saying it says you cutting, didn't away yet? cutting taxes. <laughs> Not yet. No, I'll take this home with me. He hasn't gotten to the garbage. <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> cutting taxes, creating jobs, and reforming government. We know the reform government, but okay. cutting taxes and creating jobs. Okay. Expand on that a little bit. Yes. Absolutely. Well. You know, I helped pass one of the largest middle class tax cuts in the last decade here. Um, it was done as a program, and it was done during this particular governor's first term in office. You know, you know when everybody wants to turn around and slam everybody up there. The, re the reality is this. You praise publicly and you criticize privately. I, I, I was the I'd be out of columns. <laughs> I'd no, be out no, of no, columns. Well, but you're in a different environment. <laughs> I learned that as a young sergeant in the Army. Look. I was the assemblyman that represented this, governor to Clinton's, what have you. And by the way, they're sending out mail now all over the place showing me walking in the Veterans Day Parade, Memorial Day Parade, with the Clintons and uh, Governor Cuomo, and, and somehow trying to insinuate that somehow I'm a left-wing liberal. Well, A, I'm not a Democrat, B, I'm not a left-wing liberal. And while I have a respectful relationship, by the way, with all three of them, and I don't mind that, the fact of the matter is, Technically, you know, they're your constituents, they so were they were. My constituents. Technically, and, I mean. and you know what? When they when they march to honor our fallen veterans, I will march proudly with anyone down that street. But that kind of thing should not be political. Well, it wasn't political. I'm but saying you know it's a Memorial they, Day they, parade. Well, they're they've trying to sent paint that out. I understand that. Yeah. No, no, they've I'm sent saying that out that, an anonymous that's, mail is it's ridiculous. That's to the character of the other side. That here we have real issues that have to be debated. Sure. And they're going after crap that, number one, is patently untrue. Absolutely. You have a voting record to prove that. It's not like you're a neophyte. 34 out of 3,400 votes. I, you know, I never missed a vote. Well, that's important, too. Hey, you know what? You know, you know, so you weren't always seeking a higher office from the office you were in. We have a problem. We have a councilman in Yorktown that likes to run for council and get elected, but he never wants to stay there. Oh, you know him. You're running he, against he him. Just got, he just got elected in, in this council seat, I believe, he was <laughs> elected. But, uh, you know, look, at the end of the day, it's an honor to serve. It is an honor to serve in these capacities. And as a result, uh, I don't fault anyone who wants to do this. 
But I do think you have to kind of make your bones to be able to do it and be able to do it effectively. If you're going to do this, you need to have had some experience that allows you to do this. Now, I will tell you, I had three teaching positions, all of which I gave up along with the consulting business to do my assembly business to the exclusion of everything. Uh, my opponent, who's a very nice guy, and, and that's, this is not a question about who's a nice guy. He's got a bar and restaurant. He's got a chiropractic business. He's got a young family. I don't know when he's going to find time to do this, but it's not a part-time job. I do this to the exclusion of everything. That's what I do. And, you know, my kids are grown. I'm divorced. I can live out of my car if I have to. And I don't know what you're talking do. about. I saw Sheldon Silver's filings, and he's able to make six figures. As Amazing, isn't it? Uh, but still do his leadership job. So obviously you can be a six-figure lawyer <laughs> and, 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 and still do your legislature. Or am I being sarcastic? Well, that's <laughs> why I put in that bill for the disclosure of outside income, by the way, yes. which did not make him thrilled with me. But you didn't get a cares? birthday card. You know, it's funny. I didn't get a birthday card from him. I don't understand why. But uh, you know what? Look, at the end of the day, I sleep with a clear conscience. If you're going to go up there, you need to be able to sleep with a clear conscience. You know what? I cast 3,400 votes on important issues that affect your life. I will tell you that at every one of those votes, someone was on the other side of it. Right. Someone voted against it. But you have to have the backbone to talk the talk, walk the walk, do the research, understand the issues, and Lord knows, you know, there's a reason have, for the race. Have you had any does. debates at all by any chance? Or? You know, it's funny because we have a debate coming up tomorrow night. It's going to be scheduled in North Salem. Um, that's taking place at 8 o'clock at the North Salem Ambulance Corps. Will they put it online? Will they, will they, do, you, do you know if they um, I believe it's going to be recorded. I don't know who is going to be there. News 12 has been invited. I don't know if they will well, be. Well, if you send a DVD to the paper, I know they'll put it online. I can tell you this now. You know Brian. I know you know Brian. Yeah, surely. And he, if you could send him a DVD of that debate, he will put it online. That's what they do. do like you the have North a, County News used to. Do you have a website set up? Oh, yeah, we do have a website, okay. and that's www.bobcastelli.com. Spell Castelli. C-A-S-T-E-L-L-I. I believe it's on the screen now as we speak. Okay. okay. Now, I've got to ask you, I, I, I'm going to ask you another question, and I'm going to throw this totally because you talk, walk the walk and talk. The, what I Go have right found ahead. is there are a lot of Republicans that are scared to death of this gubernatorial election, and there hasn't been one Senate candidate that's or incumbent that has given money to the Astorino campaign. Not one. Not a dime. Would you endorse Rob Astorino or are you part of those Republicans for Cuomo? No. Rob is Rob is a friend of mine. I know the governor. I've worked well with him. I have respect for the man. We're talking about an but, election. But Rob is a friend and he's a, he's a good man and he can certainly do a good job. So well, would you, if he said, can you endorse me, would yeah, you would. do that? Yeah, I would. Because I, I hate these Republicans that won't. Yo, how can, yo, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, Astorino can't win, so I won't endorse him. I won't well, help him you know, so the, I can make my prophecy so, win. So if you're the, looking the, for the Republican that's going to support a Republican, Bob's your man. That's what I'm asking. I mean, you. the same senators who threw me under the bus are the same ones who threw Rob <laughs> under the bus. Now, you well, know what? yes, uh, you have a lot in common. But you know what? i, I got to tell you something. I understand how politics works. I, I am not the endorsed candidate of the party. This is the reason we have primaries. It's called a democratic process. Got no problem with that. But Rob Astorino is the endorsed candidate of the Republican Party, and he deserves the support of every Republican. Right. Agreed. And the fact that the Senate has bailed out on this man is, is disgraceful. But, it, so. but does it surprise you, considering the culture that's in Albany, that when Cuomo gets rid of the Moreland Commission, which I interpreters saying, don't worry, guys, I can't help you with the feds, but at the state level, I got your back. They're just returning in kindness. You know, I don't know what the Senate does and why they do it. I told uh, the head of the Senate, we've met the enemy and he is us. And if we as Republicans want to continue with our agenda, and by the way, that governor supported our agenda. We, you know, we, we, those of he us He understood who, what you understood. You had a compromise. I mean, we had on-time budgets. We had a middle-class tax cut. We had the Property tax, tax cap, cap which, is, which is one of the things. We had the MTA payroll tax, which I was co-sponsor of that bill. So it's like there are a multitude of things that he did following our agenda. And we complimented him for it, and he should have been. You know what? When a guy does the right thing, and he does it for all of us, 
How many times have credit? I said a stop clock is right twice a day? Nobody's always wrong. Nobody Absolutely. is always wrong. Absolutely. But I want to ask you a question. We've got all this income now, and you know you've seen in the paper, from these settlements with the federal government on the banking scandal. We've got billions coming to the state, or four or five billion dollars coming to the state. You're in the assembly, let's say, right, or the Senate, whatever where you want to be. You're, the governor says, do I spend this money on hiring more cops, more teachers, or do I spend it on infrastructure or paying down the debt? Because it's a one-shot deal. You know this money is never coming here's, back again. Here, Where would thing. you go with this? I think the answer is all three of those are legitimate options. And I think what you need to do is you need to make an informed decision on this. And by the way, it doesn't have to all be spent in one pile on one thing. Right. It can be paired off by percentage to those three things. But I think what you do is you look at what you need the most, you determine where it can have the most effect. And as with any bill, by the way, when you pass it, you look at all sides of the argument, and then you look for the unintended consequence. Where do we get the most bang okay. for the buck? Right, well, that's the thing. You're talking about a one-shot infusion of money. Now, if you, recur, if you give it to something that is a recurring expense, eventually that money runs out, but the expense doesn't, and then that's shifted to the taxpayer. And everybody thinks that their priority is the priority. You talk to any special lobby, you've dealt with lobbyists. They all think that this is the most important issue in the world. They like a tunnel vision. Right. You know, it's, they, but, but you do actually have, and the president has said this, the governor has said this, we have infrastructure problems that need an infusion of cash, but not a continued infusion, just the infusion of cash to build, to get it done. So wouldn't you want to go, and, and that would go to a lot of communities across the state. You're talking about billions. You know, other than the Tappan Zee Bridge, most other infrastructure improvements are in the hundreds of millions, not billions. Truly. And I, and I would think that, I would, uh, that it would be, in, you know, to give it to a recurring expense, uh, even though it's necessary politically. I understand. That. I accept it. I, I, I don't like it, but I accept it. Oh. But I would say, and I would, uh, that you would want to see, because you probably know this area. You've been here how many years? Oh, absolutely. I've been here for 35 years. I bet you can name 10 areas off the top of your head. Just the, if off the top of your head that an infusion of cash one time fixes the problem. Certainly, the, you know, the area of 202 where they want to build Costco in Yorktown is one of those areas where, and, and by the way, Yorktown, as you know, is, is being offered that by Costco to sweeten the deal to get them in there. But, you know, uh, uh, again, all these things sound great, but you've got to look at the unintended consequence. And by the way, the $900 million Yorktown's supposed to get as far as a tax windfall is money that's not coming from the small businessmen who may be driven out of business around us. So... This is not a black and white issue no. in these areas. This is why you got to learn what the issue is and recognize, by the way, if you believe in home rule, to do things in such a way that works for the people that you serve. Bob, 30 seconds Sir. left. Why should they vote Why for should you? they vote for you? I have the experience. I have the integrity. I have done this before. It is an honor to serve. I would be honored to have people vote for me in this race. I will continue to serve them well. Good luck. God bless you. And if voters are angry right now at the New York, uh, New York legislature and they're looking for someone who's not part of the establishment, you're the man. Amen to that, sir. Question, though, which, which really encourages what happens in Albany as we go off. Corruption. You see it, you fight it, or you just say, well, it's not me, it's not my business. No, no. At the end of the day, if you are not part of the solution, you are by default part of the problem. Bob, I do wish you the best of luck, and I hope you win, because I think you're the only one that can beat the Democrat. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.